All right, welcome everyone. I'm uh, excited to uh, introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Dr. Catherine Grimm of CSU East Bay. She has her uh, bachelor's degree in physics from UCLA and her PhD in particle physics from Stony Brook University. It's there where she started working on D0 at Fermilab in, in particle physics. Um, and then she took a postdoc at, uh, oh, I didn't write it down here, but at Lancaster, Lancaster in England. But all of that time was actually spent at, uh, in Geneva at CERN um, working on the large, large Hadron Collider. So that's why the turnout is so good. Everyone's here to talk here about the LHC and, and the Higgs boson. She was on part of the team that found the Higgs boson, the experimental evidence of it, of course, and as a, as, as a member of the ATLAS collaboration, one of the two main instruments there. Um, that's getting it right, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. um, she continues her work on ATLAS from her now nearby institution of CSU East Bay. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Dr. Katie. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to try to talk loud, but if you if you can't hear me, if I start to get talk, just give a little raise your hand, and I'll try to talk louder again. Um, okay, so yes, I'm going to talk today about um, my work at the Large Hadron Collider and specifically about the Higgs boson. So first I'll show a picture of the Large Hadron Collider. So this is uh, Geneva, Switzerland. This is with the Alps in the background. And this is an outline uh, above ground of where the accelerator is. So it's a tunnel underground, 100 meters underground, and it uh, collides protons together. And the protons are collided at these four places along the, the circle. And at those places, we have huge detectors. And so the detector where I collect data is called Atlas. It's over here. Uh, it takes a long time to cross. It's like 25 minutes if you want to go to the other experiment on the other side. So it's really a, a gigantic ring, uh, much bigger than the one I did my PhD on in, in Chicago, for instance. And the reason that we have it so big is because uh, we want to get it going really, really fast. And I'll talk about that a little bit, about how that helps to get going really fast. Um, I'll also say one word about CERN. So CERN is the name of the lab that is uh, in Geneva, just under the map here. So CERN was uh, created just after World War II um, to bring people back together in Europe especially particle physicists working on the bomb. So they created, uh, they created this lab that was only for peace. It was a peaceful scientific endeavor to bring people together from different countries. And so initially, here's a, like an old picture, it was just some European countries, and now it's really, really a global collaboration of people from all over the world who come together to do science at CERN. And that's partially uh, you know, a nice thing to be able to work with people from around the world, but also, to be able to build something this big, you need resources from many, many countries. Um, and you need people, a lot, a lot of people. So it's uh, uh, helpful for the people, helpful to bring people together, and helpful for the science. So that, I thought that was a cool thing to work um, with all people from around the world. OK, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is first an introduction to, to particle physics. So what are elementary particles? Uh, then I'll talk about the main questions that we have in particle physics. So what are we trying to answer with, the, with an accelerator, for instance? Um, and specifically, because I work on the Higgs boson, I'm going to talk about what the Higgs boson is and how we're trying to answer these questions using the Higgs boson or by studying the Higgs boson. Um, and, and to be able to answer that, I'll talk about specifically what we do on a day-to-day -day basis to study the Higgs boson. So I'll talk about how the detector works, and how we get the signal out of the data. And then I'll show you our latest stuff that we've published. OK, so first, what are, what are elementary particles? So this is a question that people have always had. Basically, what is the smallest thing? What is, what is everything made of down to the very, very smallest thing? Where, where can you say that we've gotten to something that's indivisible? So people have always wondered this. Um, the, the term atom comes from uh, ancient Greece, but even before that, people were wondering what's inside of everything. And so this is a, a question that has evolved. Uh, at, at one point, we thought atoms were it, as what everything is made of, and, and everything is made of atoms, but now we've gotten inside of the atom. So we think that we have uh, now 
the set of elementary particles. <coughs> we think that the entire universe is made of these particles. So it's uh, six quarks, six leptons, four force carrying bosons, and the Higgs boson. So just, uh, what was that, 12 plus four, 17 particles. 17 particles to make up the entire universe. Um, and in fact, it's even less than that for most of the universe. So here I've circled the quarks and the leptons that are in our everyday matter. So in everyday matter, we have protons and neutrons, and those are made of the up quark and the down quark. That's sort of illustrated here. The proton has three quarks and the neutron has three quarks. And the atom, of course, has electrons in it. So we're familiar with electrons from electricity. And anytime there's radioactive decay or fusion in the sun, there's electron neutrinos. So a lot of our everyday life is made up of these particles. So really, we've gotten down to not very many particles that make up everything. And the other pieces of the, uh, of the, the elementary particle table are heavier versions. So these are the, the up and down quark here, and then the charm and the strange, and the top and the bottom. Those are heavier versions of the up and the down. So anytime you have an up quark, uh, sorry, a top quark or a bottom quark mixed together in some uh, heavy conglomerate of particles, it will eventually decay back down into our known matter. So we live in a stable universe for the most part, and that's why we're over here on the lightest side of the quarks and the leptons. The heavier ones here are uh, not stable, and so they always just decay back down to, uh, to electrons. So the only place to find these is where you have extra energy that allows them to exist in, uh, in a semi-stable state for a, a fraction of a second. So that means inside of a particle detector or inside of like a super high energy astrophysical event. So you can get uh, muons for sure from cosmic rays, really high energy cosmic rays hitting the, the atmosphere or inside of, uh, <coughs> inside of supernovas or early in the universe. So let me go to the picture I have of early in the universe. Oh, and I should just say, we consider this the, the rules that govern all of these particles to be the standard model of particle physics. So not only this list of 17 particles, but also the math that dictates how something decays into something else, or how does radioactive decay work? Those rules are called the standard model. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. OK, so I was saying that the, those heavier particles can exist when, uh, when there's more energy present. So there's more energy. That's what we're trying to do in the accelerator. Or if you just go back in time, uh, the energy that exists now in the universe was uh, in a much smaller area. So there was a high concentration of high energy. And that allowed uh, for some of these heavier particles to exist. So in going higher in energy in an accelerator, you're in some sense going back further in time to when you had a hotter, denser environment in the universe. And by studying what happens in those high energy environments, we can understand a little bit about the evolution of the universe, or at least what was happening in those environments when it was so hot. Here's another picture that <coughs> shows specifically, uh, here's atoms. Before atoms, the, the protons and electrons weren't going around each other. Before that, there was uh, free quarks. They weren't yet coalesced into atoms. So there was a, a, a cooling that condensed everything and eventually led to, to planets. And then you go back in time and you get heavier things and you also get things that are broken apart. Okay. So, uh, so what, do we, what do we know? I said that we know uh, what visible matter is made of. So we think that all visible matter is made of... Uh, quarks and leptons, and we know about the heavier, rarer particles. We think we know all of them, but of course we're still looking to make sure. Um, we also know how elementary particles interact with each other. So how do, how do you put particles together to make composite particles? How does the, the proton work? What's inside of it? And uh, 
How do heavier particles decay? We know the rules. We can predict the lifetime that a heavier particle will have um, before it decays. We also know that the, uh, the elect electricity and magnetism are really the same force. And also electricity and magnetism can be written as the same force as the weak force. So we now say that it's the electroweak force. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how people want to then com continue with this unification. We have electroweak. Can we bring in the strong force? Can we bring in gravity? That's a, a goal people have. Um, we also know why uh, particles have mass. So this is related to the Higgs boson. So I'm going to talk about this. Um, but these things certainly immediately lead you to say, well, what do we not know? So we don't know uh, whether we can unify the forces further. Can we make the strong force the same, written in the same equation as the electroweak force? Can we consider that one force that just applies in different situations? And can we bring in gravity? Why is gravity so much weaker than the other forces? So if you compare the strength of gravity, it's many, many times weaker than the other forces. And why, why would that be? We also have a question about uh, matter and antimatter. So I didn't talk about it in the picture of the elementary particles, but each particle has an antiparticle. So for every, uh, I go back. <coughs> for every one of these quarks, there's an antimatter uh, partner, and for every lepton, there's also an antimatter partner. But there's way, way more matter than antimatter in the universe. And if you trace back, if you try to understand the early universe, there's no reason that it shouldn't be just equal parts matter and antimatter. And so we're trying to understand there must have been something that happened, some rule that makes it so that in the end you're left with more matter and not so much antimatter. Because here we all are with more matter and not smashing into our antimatter selves. We also, um, I'm sure you have heard that uh, a lot of the energy in the universe we think is dark matter and dark energy. And so that's a, that's a big question. So where is that on our table? We say we know about visible matter. What about all that other matter in the universe? Is that somehow a piece of the, the standard model? Is there a, another column that we're missing that uh, doesn't interact with our matter? So that's a, a question that people try to to get to uh, at CERN. Can we, can we understand where these other particles are? Can we create some? Uh, and now we do have this evidence for the Higgs boson, this brand new particle that was discovered. So the 17th of our, you know, we had this model that there were 16 particles and then uh, four years ago we discovered one more. Um, so can, is, are we sure that we know what we're, we're dealing with with this new particle? So that's a big question that is still uh, people are working on it, and specifically I'm working on. So um, I'm going to talk about that and how, even in studying the Higgs boson, how you can sort of bring in some of these other questions. We're always interested in um, coming up with a theory that might encompass some of these other answers. Okay, so <clears throat> let me try to tell you about the Higgs boson. I have to say that the Higgs boson is not easy to explain, so um, I'm going to give it a try, uh, or just to get a sense anyway for what, what it is we've, uh, we've found. Um, so the way I like to think of it is to first think about the, the equation that is the standard model. So you can write down the standard model in the same way that, that you can write down um, like the, the energy equation for a pendulum or for something falling. You can write down the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So this thing is moving and so it has kinetic energy and it's interacting with gravity and so it has some potential energy. If you take in quantum mechanics, you can write down <coughs> excuse me, a similar equation for some particle. So here's a particle with sort of some kinetic energy and interacting with uh, a potential. So it could be gravity or it could be one of the other forces. So you can write it down in the same way you would for something falling. You can write down for a, a quantum mechanical particle. So uh, just, 
just adding a little something with this interaction of your particle with a, a potential, you can write down the interaction real small here at the bottom <coughs> between every one of those elementary particles. So we, we said we know how, how uh, quarks and leptons interact. So you can write that down as uh, one term in your equation. We know how the quarks interact with the bosons. We know how the bosons interact together. Each one of those becomes a term in your equation. Then you just have this uh, energy equation or the Lagrangian for each one of those, the combinatorics of each of the elementary particles interacting with each other. And luckily there's not that many, so you can just, you write down each one of these. And then you have the Lagrangian that really describes the entire standard model. And that's certain they sell it on a cup. So <laughs> you, can, you can write it down in this super, super shorthand of like all of the particles interacting and then the, the Higgs particles interacting and those correspond to these are little Feynman diagrams of like the W uh, boson interacting with a or the Z boson or the gluons interacting with each other. Uh, the gluons, I think I didn't say, that's the strong force carrier. So the, the weak force is associated with the W and Z bosons and the, the strong force is associated with the gluons and the electromagnetic force is associated with the photon. Here. It's also written on a t-shirt. Here, I, I wanted to emphasize that um, this top part, which is very condensed um, in this notation, but this is most of the interactions of the particles. And then this new part here is, uh, has to do with really with the, uh, the Higgs. So there's a big portion of the Lagrangian that has this, this interaction with the Higgs. But OK, let's get to that now. So, OK, one of, the, one of the criteria for this Lagrangian, so that just means this energy equation, is that it has to work all the time. It has to be gauge invariant. So in a sense, that means it has to work in all locations and all time. It, you can't, uh, <coughs> or like if you think of a, a potential difference, it can't depend on the actual potential you're dealing with. You just care about the difference of sort of a gauge invariance. Um, so this is a, a fundamental requirement that if you have a, if you really want to describe exactly how all those particles interact, it better work at all times and in all places. This is supposed to be the entire universe we're describing. So, uh, but they tried to ask, add. Um, there was a thing missing from the from the standard model. So, when they unified the electromagnetic force with the weak force, they saw that there should be uh, force carriers for the weak force and for the electromagnetic part. There should be three that have mass and one that doesn't have mass. And the ones with mass were the W and the Z, the W plus, the W minus, and the Z. So the W is a charged one and the Z is neutral. So there's two Ws and one Z. Those have mass and when the weak force interacts, you can write it down as the exchange of one of these bosons. And then there was a fourth piece and that was the photon with no mass. And so they could write out one equation that represented the electroweak force, either with a massive boson or with a massless photon. OK, so that was a great triumph. And we were able to predict a lot of things. We could predict that the W and the Z would be found at CERN, and then they were. And predict a lot about radioactive decay. So that was a working, working piece of the standard model. But then when they put in those masses, it broke the gauge invariance of the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian for the entire standard model that we thought we understood of all the particles interacting no longer worked. It, it became non-invariant. So uh, then everybody questioned, can the star, is, maybe everything's broken. Is the standard model not true? Uh, how do we, how do we uh, account for all of the success of this model? but also account for this uh, fact that we know that particles have mass, not just the W and the Z, but all the particles have mass except the photons, and none of them could be added to the Lagrangian. Uh, okay, so Peter Higgs had this idea. Is him having an idea? Uh, yes. Dr. Graham, I'm wondering of, of, of a simple way to, to think about the, the gauge invariance breaking. You've, you've, you've got this model that 
that says, hey, we had all these different forces in nature, and this is going to simplify it down into one, like simply the electro weak. Mm -hmm. um, does the gauge invariance, the, the thing, it was beautiful, and then it broke this thing, and it broke the idea that I should be able to look at, I'm going to say it in a really broad way, but look at it from any angle or from any perspective, and the laws should be the same. And then it says, oh, no, it's not. Is it simply that, that, that there was this massless and massive particles in those force carriers? Like, was, is it a, I, I'm just wondering if it's as simple as that, going, oh, you notice that you have massless ones and massive ones, and that can't be invariant in this, in this way. Well, basically, yes. If, you ha if they were all massless, I believe it would all continue to work. But we, we uh, there's one way to do the formula, and it comes out that you get three massive ones and one uh, massless one. But then you put it into the entire piece, and those terms are no longer uh, gauge invariant. And so if they, if you had just put them in as massless, all the bosons are massless, then it would still work. So. It was, a, it was working from one way and then not from the other way, and then we discovered those bosons, and they do have mass. So actually, the discovery of those leading up to the Higgs boson was the thing that said there has to be a Higgs boson, because now we found these force-carrying particles, yes. isolated them for the first time, they have mass, and wow, that wild idea that somebody had comes forward, that's the way the universe works, and now we better hunt for a way to make the laws simple again. Yes, exactly. Okay. And especially the simple again, because of course people had different ideas, but Higgs had the most simple idea. Uh, so it, Higgs and Ungler at the same time had this idea that you don't write in the, uh, you don't just write in the mass, basically, and that's what breaks everything. Instead, you write in another field. So if you write in that the universe is, it comes with it, just like there's sort of space time, there's also a field that goes throughout the universe, and every single particle interacts with that field. So then the term in the Lagrangian is instead the interaction of your particle with the Higgs field. And then it works at all, it's gauge invariant, it works at all space and time. So here are some people playing on a mat that represents the Higgs field, and this particle is interacting more with the Higgs field, and this particle is interacting less with the Higgs field. And what that comes out to is that this particle has more mass, and this particle has less mass. So the W and the Z boson have a lot of mass. The, uh, the up quark and the down quark only have a little bit of mass, and that comes out as their interaction with the Higgs field. Okay, so this, this was the idea, and then we said, how can we prove that? That seems to work. And then the answer is, if there's a Higgs field, there's also some, uh, a particle associated with that field, and that's the thing that we're going to try to find. And if that exists, then it seems like the whole thing is true. So this is, uh, we got to look for this <laughs> to show that it, it all works. Okay, so, so how do we do that? How do you look for a new particle? So if the Higgs exists, it, it, which it, we've now found, it, it uh, lasts for only a fraction of a second, and so then it decays into uh, the, the known particles. So just like I was saying, the heavy particles are always decaying into lighter particles. The Higgs boson will just last for a fraction of a second in an environment where there's enough energy, and then it will decay to lighter particles, to a lower energy state. And you can calculate what it should decay into. It should decay into more heavy particles because it has this association with mass. So into W and Z bosons. Um, it, into the, I drew it in real little. It goes into the top quark for just a second, which then decays into photons. Uh, it decays into the tau particle, which is like a heavy electron, and to the bottom quark, which is another heavy quark. This is a, a graph that shows, um, based on what the, the mass of this new Higgs boson particle is, what it should decay into, and these are the rates. So if the Higgs, initially when we were looking for the Higgs boson, we had no idea what its mass was. That's not predicted in the theory. So 
we were first, of course, looking at lower energies because that's easier to make in an accelerator. Um, and then eventually, eventually, those were ruled out, and we finally found the Higgs at 125 GeV. And so you can look at what the, the rates are that it should decay into. Uh, if for a mass of 125 GeV, mostly it decays into bottom quarks. And uh, measuring, now that we have the Higgs, measuring the, the rates that it does decay into these things tells us if our theory is correct. There's a lot of calculation that goes into doing these, and if we can measure and make sure that we get back what we predicted, that tells us that we have the correct theory. I'm going to say one more thing that is confusing, but this is um, part of the results I'll show at the end. So here's, we, sh we said the Higgs is decaying into these other lighter particles, and that does tell us something about the Higgs, that we've understood the way it interacts with other particles. It also can interact with itself. So very, very occasionally, the Higgs boson decays into Higgs bosons, and that tells us about this, this field, the, the, uh, the potential in the universe. If the way it's um, often stated is, if this is the Higgs potential, it looks like a sombrero. It's got a high point in the middle at zero, and then it's got these two dips which then become uh, stable minima. And at some point in the early universe, the, the universe was at this unstable maxima, and then there was some little quantum fluctuation, and the universe <coughs> fell into one or the other side of this well, and that's called electroweak symmetry breaking because you're no longer symmetric. And then all the particles got mass. So before that, they didn't have mass, but then they fell, there was some little bump, and now we're in this dip. And some people say, well, we better measure this dip because what if it isn't this shape? What if it's like another unstable maximum, minimum? And then at some quantum fluctuation, we'll bump into another little thing and everything will have a different mass. Okay, I will talk a little bit more about this. But what I would like to emphasize is that we are measuring the Higgs decaying into these particles, which tells us how the Higgs <coughs> interacts with matter and bosons. And then we will also want to try to look for the Higgs interacting with itself. And then we'll understand a little bit about the, the whole field. OK, so that's sort of the theory, which is so hard, but um, interesting. Now we can, um, let's go measure it. So now we go to the accelerator. <laughs> Here's the accelerator again, right? So we're smashing together the particles. What do we want? We want to create a really high energy environment similar to some environment at the start of the universe. Um, and we're gonna do it just in a really tiny space and so we're gonna have to make that environment really, really frequent, frequently. So the Large Hadron Collider collides protons every 25 nanoseconds. So that's 40,000 times a second and it runs um, about six months a year continuously. So this is from this year. Um, it turns off in the winter when the uh, electricity is really expensive, and then they turn on in May, and this is a measure of the amount of data that's collected. So they, they start right in. There's like little, little stopping points where they fix things, but for the most part, they run continuously. They're gonna stop at the beginning of November. So, uh, the data is, is measured in femto barns, which is related to the cross section of the, uh, the crossing of the, the protons. We've collected so far this year 60 femto barns, and that's really, really impressive. A lot of um, uh, successful running because the last two years we collected 80 femto barns. So we really, people are super excited that we've crossed 100. So we have tons and tons of data, um, which is great. Okay, so where would we like these? We would like this collision to happen exactly right here uh, because we have built this gigantic uh, detector in order to measure exactly what happens when the protons cross. So uh, when they cross, right in this spot, this is a cross-section view. Um, tons and tons of new particles spill out and we measure the trajectories and the energies of all of those particles. So I'm gonna try to show you this video. 
Pull. Okay, so this is a zoom in of the Atlas experiment. So they showed in the video that it's underground. Uh, it's 100 meters underground, and that's um, both to protect the detector from cosmic rays and to protect the people from radiation. So it's, you have to take a, an elevator down 100 meters if you want to go and visit it. Um, and it, the detector is built Again, the protons hit together right here, and it's built like an onion, so there's many layers, and the middle layer is the most sensitive, and then they get like um, grainier as you go out, bigger pixels as you move out. And the whole thing, it's about, I think, here's a person right here, it's like four stories high, and the precision at the <coughs> inner layers is like smaller than it's, um, micrometers, so really, really highly precise and really, really big. So it, that's why it takes so, so many people to build these. And it takes many, many years. This is the, the middle part of the detector, so the very center of the onion. So the protons hit right here, and then you've got layers of silicon and also um, tubes. So these tubes that are filled with gla uh, gas and then a charged particle goes through that uh, emits some electrons. Somebody else is having it. Is that, so, is that outside? That's not the video plane? Oh, it's possible it's It might be video. the video plane. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's probably the next one that they also put a lot of music in. Very smart. Um, okay, so you have a, a proton or some particle here that's being shown going through and it hits each of these layers and then we get uh, a mark that uh, we, you know, we can reconstruct the track and we also get um, a measure of how much energy came out. So uh, some of them are tubes. This is a tube where the particles goes in, it releases some, um, uh, ionizes the gas and then that is a current that flows down the wire down the middle of the the tube and then we read it out so we know the position and then based on the number of uh, the charge we know the energy and that whole thing is in a magnetic field and what happens when a charged particle goes through <coughs> a magnetic field it turns and we know that it turns the the radius of the turn is based on the momentum and we know that the uh, direction of the turn is based on whether or not the thing is a plus one or minus one. So if it's a, a positron, it will turn one way, and if it's an electron, it will turn the other way. So that rule that things turn in a magnetic field is really the basis of a lot of particle physics, uh, or at least of the detector, is um, figuring out whether you had a, a positive or a negative particle, and then what the momentum of that particle was. Here's a picture of a whole bunch of particles going into, this is an old-fashioned detector, like a cloud, I think this is a cloud chamber, where you get a little tiny bubble um, or a piece of uh, vapor where the particle has gone through, and then because of the magnetic field, you get things turning either one way or the other, depending on the charge. So I won't go through each piece of the detector, but here's the part that I showed, the tracking the part. So this really, uh, the, you wanna get the trajectory of the particle and you wanna measure the momentum. Um, then there's a series of calorimeters that are designed to stop particles, so to measure all of the energy that they had. And you can distinguish between particles based on how much energy they had and how they, <coughs> disperse their energy in the calorimeters. So a really heavy quark makes it through a lot of material and then makes a, a, a scattering jet. So uh, this one says proton, this is a proton going in and when it hits matter, so it hits other atoms, it releases uh, electrons and moves around the neutrons or the atoms excuse me, in the uh, material it hits and it makes these shower shapes. 
And you can distinguish the shower shapes between different types of quark particles. You can also distinguish between electrons and photons and between electrons and muons. Muons make it out really, really far all the way to the end. And so in that way, you smash together your protons and then you can distinguish the particles that are coming out of the, out of the collision. I think I wrote in, yeah, muons, hadrons, which is the name for particles made of quarks, um, energy from electrons and, and photons, those are stopped in this first layer, and then the trajectories of anything that has a charge. And then, so the thing that we are measuring is, it's not very many quantities. We measure the charge, we measure the path, so the way, the direction it went, uh, the momentum and the energy. And basically all the physics has to come from those uh, four quantities. Okay, I'm going to spend um, just a moment talking about some of the tricky ways of identifying specific particles because this is really what people are working on a day-to-day -day basis and, and it's, it's cool. So, okay, B quarks. <coughs> These are called B jets. So this means that um, uh, anything that has a bottom quark in it. So we said that the Higgs decays into bottom quarks. So this was especially um, important to study how bottom quarks can be identified in the particle detector. So for the most part, uh, any quark particle will come through this tracking part. It'll leave a, a little trail. It'll go through the electromagnetic calorimeter and it will be stopped in this big uh, calorimeter, the hadronic calorimeter, and it will leave a shower. But it's a, it's a little bit hard to distinguish between the different types of quarks. But luckily with a B quark, when it is initially created, so here it's initially created at this primary vertex, that's where the two protons hit each other, it will uh, form together with another quark. So quarks never like to be alone. This is part of the strong force. The strong force gets stronger as you move away, so that means that particles always stick together. Um, even if it means taking a new particle out of the quantum vacuum, it will pull a new particle out and put it with it so that it doesn't have to be alone. That's a, sort of one of the rules of quarks. So if a B quark is created, it will immediately bond with another quark. And that quark will have some little lifetime, so it will travel a little ways, and then it will decay uh, into lighter things. And this property allows us to look for a primary vertex and then a secondary vertex. So you look for particles that are coming out of the initial place where the protons hit each other, and then you look for a second place where particles are coming out. And this distinguishing between the primary vertex and the secondary vertex allows you to say that was a B quark. So other quarks also bond with uh, particles right when they're created, but they don't have this lifetime. It's the B, it's a special characteristics of uh, B mesons or, or particles that have a B quark in them that they last a little bit of time. And so they have time to travel in the detector before they decay. So that uh, identification of a B quark is dependent on this traveling a little ways and creating a secondary vertex. Okay, so that's the first one. And the second one I wanted to talk about is the tau. So that's another particle that the Higgs decays into. The tau is a, a heavy electron. It decays into electrons and also muons and quarks. Um, and we know exactly the way that it decays. It decays via the weak force and it releases a neutrino. And we can calculate uh, exactly how often it should decay into these different, uh, into a muon or an electron or a quark. And then we can identify the, the way that that should look in the detector. So for the most part, the problem is that when a, when a tau uh, decay, decays, it looks a lot like a quark decaying. So when the two protons hit each other, for the most part, there's a lot of light quarks that come out. And so the background to every signal you want to see is tons of quarks coming out of the detector. So everything is about distinguishing between these 
random quarks coming out and something you're really looking for. So you're really looking for this tau and instead you're seeing all these other quarks. And the way that you can distinguish it is primarily because the tau decays very particularly into three little <coughs> pions uh, or sometimes five little pions, but they're close together compared with quarks that are spread apart more. And so this is super hard, but you make a lot of models of how quarks uh, are looking when they're coming out of the collision and how taus look when they come out of the collision. Uh, so I've written down some uh, distinguishing characteristics. The number of tracks outside of this blue cone. So you, you make a little cone around your decay and you count the number of tracks that are in there and you do that for a simulation of taus and a simulation of quarks and then you can write it down and they look different. And there's, you can also measure the momentum that is inside that close place compared with the whole thing. And you come up with a whole lot of different variables that talk about how the, these two shapes are different. And then you can either say, okay, if I want to distinguish the taus, then I'm only going to take uh, collision events that exist where the, most of the taus lie in each of these variables but then you cut out a lot of data. So instead we train, we do artificial intelligence and train uh, boosted decision trees to make these cuts for us. So they, you, you show a boosted decision tree, all of these uh, different variables, and then it figures out the best cuts to make, and then it creates uh, a discriminant. So this is um, a label that's attached to every collision event saying whether it's more like a tau or m more like a regular quark. So you can see that the red ones, you've plugged back in what you know to be taus and it calls most of those taus, not everyone, but most of them. And you plug back in what you know to be a quark and, and it correctly identifies those as more quark-like. So then you can make a cut that's here and have a huge signal compared to background. Yes. Dr. Grimm, this is, I think this is very advanced, but it's also a, a remarkably clear job, that, that, that diagram of showing you can say, well, the, the spray looks like this, we're looking for sprays that spray out like this. I just wanted to mention one of our students did their project and they were looking for the, and now in seeing your diagram before, he was looking at BB, I don't know, mm -hmm. is it pronounced BB VAR? Yes. B, B, so he was looking for those, and of course you showed us why someone would do that. That's the most likely, for the Higgs boson of its mass, it's most likely going to divide into those two things. Right. And you told us about the number of data events happening, right? Every 90, 90, 25, <coughs> is it 25 nanoseconds. nanoseconds. Yeah. So you have to have this in place to even decide, I mean, is that right? You have to have this in place to even decide what to keep to look later and say, what can we find out about the physics of the very small That's of right. the Higgs boson? That's right. After you spend a long time making sure you've done this right, you can apply it really early on in the data uh, filtering process and get rid of events that are no good, that are uninteresting to you. So can I ask, I, mean, I don't want to, monopolize your time but so you when you were talking you were showing the total some luminosity or you know of all the events studied right mm -hmm. but the events studied is that part of why the slope is is steeper or maybe that was just total integrated number of events you're keeping is your hit rate let's say of getting Higgs boson events like much better now than it was in the past because people have have developed these tools? That, uh, that graph was just what we collected, so it doesn't show what has been thrown away. Okay. Uh, the, the throwing away, the efficiency of collecting Higgs boson events has gotten better and better. We're also taking in way more, we're able to take in more data at a time, so we throw away more, but we also keep more. Uh, so that um, set of cuts has gotten better. Uh, so we're, yeah, and then we're going to upgrade again to get more data, and then we're going to everybody has to figure out how to deal with that and, and throw away more and keep more. Got it. Thank yeah. You. Thank you.
Okay, uh, another reason that this is cool is that this is used in a lot of industry now. And it used to be that particle physics was sort of at the beginning and now, now we're not at, at the forefront of this machine learning, but it still works really well and now uh, particle physics is trying to learn from industry. So, you know, you go over to Google and they're doing boosted decision trees just like crazy. Uh, and so you can learn from, from their um, algorithms. Here's an example where you're trying to decide if you're looking at a picture of the sky or a building and you sort of decide is it smooth, is it green, is it uh, long. So these types of decisions can go into not just particle physics but really a lot of uh, machine algorithms. Okay, so let's say that we now have decided that we have a collision that has two, let's, let's do the, the bees and the taus. This one is, well, okay, we'll do this one first. This one is uh, someone else made the algorithm to distinguish what an electron looks like or what a muon looks like, which is way easier than the bees and the taus. Um, this is the, the first place they discovered the Higgs boson, was the Higgs decays into a, two Z bosons and those, in turn, decay into light particles, electrons, and muons. And it's, it's fairly easy to see electrons and muons in the detector. And you take those energies of those four particles and you add them up. And that should give you the energy of the initial Higgs boson. And it should, in principle, it should, I mean, actually, what it gives you is the mass of the initial Higgs boson. It's E equals mc squared. This had some mass, and that went into energy that was given to these particles. So on the uh, histogram here, you have uh, the, the combined mass of the four leptons, the four uh, particles that it finally decayed into. And then you, see, you make a little count every time you got that mass, and you see that you get a big spike in counts at 90, and that's the mass of the, the Z boson, so that's good. We, we know that the Z boson does have some mass, and so we see that. And then they also got another bump at 125, and that was from the mass of the new particle, the Higgs boson. So we're always making these graphs of the mass and then looking for a bump. They call it bump, bump hunting. So this is for Higgs decaying into two Zs, which is a, a low rate, but easy to see. Uh, this is a picture of that. So you can see if the particle goes way to the outside of the detector, that means it's a muon. And so that's why it's really easy to detect a muon. Um, it's also fairly easy to detect an electron because they're just uh, clean and not spread out like the quarks. Here's the same graph of the mass on the bottom, but this time it's two taus. So you had the Higgs boson decay into two taus. You identified them with your boosted decision tree, and then add up. You add up all of the uh, energies to get the mass. And here you can see that um, you have a lot of different colors added on top of each other, and that's because there's a lot of backgrounds still that look like taus or that really are taus. You have the Z boson decaying into taus, and that's in blue. You have uh, green, which is random quarks that you've misidentified with your, your uh, boosted decision tree. You need to model how many you misidentify. And then the data is shown on top in black. So the red is the predicted Higgs boson stacked on top. So you get a little bit of extra, and that shows that you saw not just the background, but the background plus a signal. And you can see the, just the fact that there's so many other things in this plot means it was a harder, a harder job to find the Higgs boson in this channel decaying into two taus. Here's the, a second boosted decision tree that's used even to identify which um, particles are more like the Higgs and which are more like the background. So you can use boosted decision trees on boosted decision trees. Um, I think I, I won't go into the statistics. There's some very fun statistics to decide how likely it is that you got um, a significant, statistically significant answer. Um, I'm going to go back to the idea of studying what the Higgs is decaying into. So I just said that we looked at the at the tau. Um, only just this past summer, they finally found evidence of the Higgs decaying into the two Bs, into the B, B bar. 
So that uh, initial discovery of the Higgs boson was in 2012, and it took six years before they could really understand the bee jets, this process of the bees coming together, flying away, making a secondary vertex and decaying again, using that technique to find two uh, bees coming out of the Higgs and adding them back together and then <coughs> having enough data to show that those came from the Higgs. So again, you have a lot of backgrounds here that look like uh, bee jets or have bee jets in them. And then stacked on top is the, the Higgs in red. So you can see it's really contending with a lot of other backgrounds. But finally in uh, July, they found five sigma evidence. So that means really st statistically significant evidence that the, the Higgs decays into bees. Okay, now we go forward. This is a quick plot of the mass of the particle that the Higgs decays into and the strength of its coupling. So it, it decays more often into heavy things and we can plot that and see it decays more often into the top quark and the W and the Z boson and into the B quarks and the tau. It's, it's not quite the, the rate, it's the, the strength of the interaction. So the rate is the highest for the B quarks, but the strength of the interaction is higher for the W and the Z. Yes? Isn't that a sense of that, that idea of the Higgs field being, you know, the origin of mass? I mean, the, the fact that mass as a discriminant mm -hmm. for how the Higgs boson is becoming these other particles, and it follows this very clear, and I'm sure there's some analytic function that fits that really well, that says, yes, this is, Higgs is the origin of mass. Yes, yes, or at least something that behaves exactly as we have predicted the Higgs to decay, or uh, interact, yes. Um, this is the, this plot shows uh, the prediction from the standard model Higgs boson compared to what has been measured. So one is the standard model prediction, and here's how we measure the, the B quark connection, the tau's, each of the, the five big channels. So it's really lining up with what was predicted. So it seems to be Higgs boson as predicted. But we, I still want to talk one moment about the Higgs interacting with itself. So uh, this again is a piece of the Lagrangian. A piece of the description of the standard model has to do with the Higgs interacting with itself. And here's a little Feynman diagram showing this is the Higgs decaying into two more Higgses. And so we want to measure how often that happens. Uh, the most common way that we said that the Higgs decays is into B quarks. And this, this interaction, the Higgs decaying into itself, happens so rarely that you want to choose something that happens fairly often. So we're looking at the Higgs decaying into four, essentially, four B quarks and also into two B quarks and two taus. So basically, we saw the Higgs decaying into taus. We saw the Higgs decaying into Bs. Now all we have to do is look for both of those at the same time. So easy peasy. Uh, well, we can use the same techniques. It's just the problem is that it's super rare. So here's a picture of a de uh, decay where, so here's the decay happened in here, and there's two jets coming out that have been circled in uh, turquoise, and then two towels that have also come out. So we want an event that looks like that, a collision that looks like that. Uh, and so I have to show that because this is what I've been working on, but uh, we just finished this paper um, that is showing the search for two bees and two towels at the same time. And if we haven't seen anything yet. We just a couple months ago only saw for the first time the Higgs decaying into the two Bs. So to look for the two Bs and the two tiles at the same time is, you know, we're a little ahead of ourselves. But we're planning it because the detector will be upgraded, the whole uh, Large Hadron Collider will be updated, and when we have more data, we're going to do this analysis again, and then we're going to uh, look for the, the Higgs decaying into two Higgses. Um, as of now, it's just very exciting to say that we've ruled out that the Higgs does not decay into two Higgses 12 times more than predicted, which is the type of result you get all you know over and over when you're looking for something and you don't yet have enough data. You can only rule out some extraordinary uh, high deviation from what's expected. 
Uh, and we can also combine that result with looking at the, the four Bs, uh, the BB and the tau tau. You can also look at two Bs and two photons. So these are all the normal channels, but then put together. And then when they're put together, we can say we can rule out uh, the Higgs decaying into two Higgs is 12 or uh, six and a half times more than is predicted. So it's sort of the current state of affairs. And then when we get more and more data, we'll be able to see if it is actually as predicted by the standard model. And along the way, we will also look for other things. So I could go into a whole nother talk about other things that decay into two Higgses. There are many, many theories that try to answer those other questions. So what, what is dark matter? Why is gravity so weak? Can we unify the, the forces? So uh, supersymmetry is one of the names of the, the other theories that answer those questions. And some supersymmetry, uh, all supersymmetry theories say that there have to be more than one Higgs boson. There have to be five. There has to be a heavy one and a light one, for instance. And the heavy one would decay into the lighter versions of itself. So as we're looking for the Higgs decaying into two Higgses, we're also <coughs> looking for a large, heavy Higgs decaying into two Higgses. So this is a, a plot showing what that would look like on our mass graph. So now instead of going up to 125, we're going up to 1,400 GeV. So really high mass. Do we see some new particle out there like we saw the Higgs? So we look both for a very heavy Higgs. We're also looking for this theory about little gravitons. So they say, oh, maybe there's a compactified dimension, don't ask me what that means, that uh, has gravi gravity in another dimension and we only see little bits of gravity and that's why gravity is so weak for us. But we could see little gravitons then and they would decay into Higgs bosons. So we looked, we didn't see that, but uh, you, can make a, you can make a ruling. This is a plot that shows um, some theory for the gravitons and we have ruled out that there can be no gravitons above this amount. So there may still be uh, a small number of gravitons, but not so many. So we ruled that out with the same analysis. Okay, I will end there because I know it is five, and just say that we are producing now enough Higgs bosons at the LHC that we can start to do precision measurements. We can measure how they decay, how often they decay, and what types of things they decay into. We can also use those uh, decays to look for other types of new physics. Okay, thank you. So you said um, you have such a large amount of data that you need to have an artificial intelligence program filter out some of, most of the results right from where right now. Is there a possibility that you're already getting information on new kinds of particles and it's being filtered out by the process? Yes, for sure, and that is a constant worry, yes. so. Always, you basically, if you have some theory that you want to test, you have to do a million tests to see what would be needed to, what you would need to say to see that theory. And then, so it, everybody has their theories that they want to test, and those get put into the, the trigger, it's called, is what cuts out data or saves data. And then in addition to that, we try to save a random selection of events that's just uh, nobody decided what it should be. It's just a random selection. Um, or something really generic like the two proton the, the majority of the protons, they hit each other and then some little, nothing much happens. But if they hit each other and then um, the energy all goes in the transverse direction, that means that really um, it was converted to mass, something happened and that particle decayed. So something really happened. So then you don't say, I'm looking for something with two Bs and two tau's. You can say, I'm just looking for something where a huge amount of energy came in the other direction. And that should be sort of agnostic to specific theories. But yes, that is exactly the problem and like people spend tons and tons of time trying to make sure that we're not throwing away the new discovery that we're hoping to find. In fact, may I, I mean, one of the first cuts must have been to not want to have two events that occurred at the same time, right? And yet, the thing that you're just describing, wanting to find in the later part, was something that looks like two events at yes. some level, right? Yes, yes. So we want to make sure that we're not seeing uh, two sets of protons hitting each other, or, or even just two quarks and four quarks. 
we want just two quarks or two gluons hitting each other. And then those decaying into one Higgs boson decaying into two Higgs bosons. So exactly, we have to distinguish that from multiple quartons hitting each other. It actually happens less than, uh, you can calculate how often it happens, and it's not very often. I, I heard something that was describing, I mean, they're well separated in, yeah. in that sense. Okay, yeah. the individual, let's say, protons interacting with each other, they're well separated yes. from the other ones. It's, uh, there's also a whole lot of low energy stuff that comes out when the proton, the other particles interact a little bit and then they send out just a little bit of um, excess particles that come in. That's also very hard to distinguish. Yes. I think on my science blog on the internet, so it must be true, <laughs> uh, it was declared that five new particles have already been discovered at the uh, Right, right. So uh, we have discovered particles. I don't know if I have any, any particular uh, graph showing it. We have, in the same way that you can combine the up and the down to make a proton, you can combine the other quarks and they make a little, they make a stable particle that lasts for some amount of time and then decays. And when particle physics was first happening, all they were doing was shooting together protons or shooting together electrons and looking for these resonances, so some bump in the data. And then they learned about how the quarks interact with each other. So uh, there's like 30 known particles that are the interactions of those quarks that stick together for just a moment and then decay. And already at the LHC we've discovered something like five new ones. And so that's very exciting, but it's not as exciting as discovering something that's not in this table. Yeah. So, so okay. like an, another, a new particle, it's, it's just another combination. You say, ah, okay, they can combine in this other way and it helps us to learn more about how the quarks interact. Well, thank you, that clarifies. Yeah, yeah. In the old days, uh, there were random coincidences, and if you had a 25 second window, you worried about upping the rate. Um, can you narrow this window, or are the detectors limited in the time it takes them to rejuvenate? Uh, they would like to narrow the window, yes. Uh, it used to be every 50 nanoseconds, and then we went down to 25. Wow. Yes, <laughs> and uh, I believe that the new uh, not this coming, so we're, we're going to shut down for two years and fix things that are radiation damaged and then run a little bit longer and then shut down for five years, I believe. And then they're going to upgrade the entire detector and have a higher luminosity. And I believe with that comes a, a smaller window. I don't have the, the number in mind right now. But the, 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 the detector can do it. It's more the uh, uh, stick for the trigger. It's hard the trigger decisions. They're trying to put boosted decision trees into hardware to get the trigger to just because that's faster than a that's offline software trigger. Uh, so that's a big challenge. But it's also how you get the m more data. So I believe that the the uh, the detector components themselves do not have a problem with going a little bit quicker. Thank you. Um, out of curiosity, I think you hinted at an earlier presentation. Uh, what is the implication of the mass of the Higgs for vacuum stability? Uh, you mean the vacuum expectation? Value? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that is a component in the description of the Higgs uh, potential. Let's see if I can find my Higgs potential picture. So the, the terms that describe this potential, so that go into the Lagrangian, depend on uh, this lambda or uh, here phi that uh, depends on the vacuum expectation value and No, the, the coupling of the Higgs to itself. So those two things together. Um, and so if, 
it's not the mass of the Higgs, it is the vacuum expectation value that is measured separately by someone else, but that is a key component that needs to go in to be able to understand whether when we do measure the Higgs coupling to itself, if we are in the standard model. Oh. We had a, yeah, I was wondering, um, are the people who are hunting supersymmetry particles becoming discouraged? And will this upgrade in the future uh, broaden their chances of uh, finding some supersymmetry particles? Yes and yes. Okay. Uh, there's a, there was a lot of hope that the supersymmetric theory is, uh, seems simple and it seems to answer a lot of questions. It allows you to uh, unify the strong force in most versions of supersymmetry. It often creates a particle that could be dark matter, which would be great. Uh, and people, a lot of people thought that as soon as the LHC turned on, we'd find the Higgs and we'd find the first evidence of supersymmetry. And so far, no other particles besides the Higgs. But when we go to higher energies and we go to uh, higher luminosities, people say that not only in the, we can look always for a new bump at a higher mass, for a new particle that way. But you can also look for the rate of, of something like this that depends on all, anytime you do this calculation of how often this should happen, you have to consider the possibility that some other particle interacted in here. So in a sense, you have to include every other of those 17 particles in your calculation. And if you get down to a really, really precise measurement, you can tell whether it's just those 17 or that's something else also. And so people say, well, if you measure that really precisely, you'll know whether that we've got all the particles or there is some extra piece that we're missing. And so that's the way that you could do it if it was a really high energy particle that we needed to discover to prove supersymmetry, we could do it indirectly, discover that there's some new particle indirectly. That's great. Let's have a final question. Um, I was curious about, uh, you mentioned it earlier about the, how it created mass and transferred mass. And I was just curious how that um, worked in relation if it's um, interacting with itself. Does that make sense? Uh, I think that that's getting at some deeper, hard understanding. So you're saying, how it, does it have mass itself if it's creating mass? Um, yes, it is interacting with itself, sort of in the fact that it has mass. It's also, I, yeah, I think that's the way to say it. That it, when you when a particle has mass, you can say it couples to the Higgs field. So the photon travels through the Higgs field and doesn't see it at all. Uh, the Higgs travels through the Higgs field and it does interact with itself. And so it does give mass from that interaction with the Higgs, uh, Higgs field. It's a, good, it's a good question. It's hard. Well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.